Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to uh, the stream on WBZ, CBSBoston.com. And today I am joined by Sean Dahl, Space uh, Weather Center Coordinator. And this is an exciting day, Sean. Thanks for joining us, first off. Hey, well, welcome, Terry. Glad to be here. Thank you. Um, so Sean is here to help us out with uh, We've had such a year for astronomical events, auroras, and, um, you know, we've all heard about the possibility of another big one tonight and actually some breaking news you were just telling me off camera that um, we're getting our first real indication of what this thing might look like tonight from our satellite a million miles out. Yep, that's right, Terry. We've been waiting for this uh, coronal mass ejection, this blast of solar material and strong magnetic fields that are headed towards Earth. And yes, as we were talking just a few minutes ago, it arrived at our spacecraft one million miles from Earth. And based off the speed of that CME, it looks like it should be here within the next 30 minutes or so at Earth. And obviously it's, it's daytime here across the United States, so we won't be seeing much uh, right away. But any idea uh, from that satellite and from that data of the, the mass of, you know, how extensive it is and what kind of auroras it may spark and what the activity might look like, you know, when we actually uh, have dark tonight? Yep, we're, we're just beginning to start to uncover that now, Terry, because the CME arrived. It arrived with a magnetic strength that is about six times the normal background level that's out there in space, so that's pretty significant. Uh, we need it to be in an orientation for it to really cause and escalate geomagnetic storming, a favorable orientation. By that, I mean two magnets, if they're the same polarity, they repel. Earth's magnetic field is pointed north, so uh, thumbs up. The CME arrived at the spacecraft a million miles away in the same orientation. So we'll get an initial punch, but we probably won't escalate to potential G4 levels until that turns south if it decides to do so. Then we connect. That's when activity escalates. And this is just the early phase of that CME. This is just the shock arrival. So think of a cold front. You get the massive wind, but then the Arctic temperatures don't start to drop significantly until later. Same thing here. We'll get the shock, which we see, and then we'll get into the magnetic cloud, which will soon follow. And that's where we'll really know what to expect. So hopefully we'll know more about that in the next six hours or so. Wow, that's uh, exciting news. And we've had such a year. Uh, I think it was back in May when we had that just incredible display, a rural display uh, that we saw all over New England. And just this past weekend, um, we were getting sh amazing shots from around the area. Can you just talk a little bit about uh, why, why it's been such an amazing 2024 uh, for the Northern Lights, you know, what's going on with the sun, and might this continue into the fall and winter? Sure. Terry, it has to do with the solar cycle, roughly 11-year average period of time. It can be a few years around that 11-year marker. But we are in the midst of solar maximum of this solar cycle number 25. And what that means is the sun is now this twisted up mass of strong magnetic fields. And some of these are so localized and intense, they reveal themselves as these sunspot groups that many of your viewers would, would understand and know about. And that's the source of much of the space weather storms that we're looking for and predict, such as this inbound CME that's taking place right now before our very eyes. But this cycle has been very active, much more active than originally anticipated by the International Panel of Scientific Experts that tried to predict this cycle about five to six years ago. And that's okay. Space weather is hard stuff to figure out. But we've had a lot of events happen on the sun. Uh, all of our NOAA space weather scale categories have been uh, met at some level or other throughout this cycle. And we're in for a ride the rest of this year, all of next year, and even into 2026 before things will start to work their way back down towards solar minimum. Very interesting. Can you talk a little bit about what exactly causes an aurora? We have a graphic up right now sort of showing uh, a coronal mass ejection and the, how it interacts with the Earth's magnetic field. Maybe if you could attempt to explain to our viewers exactly you know, why we see these amazing lights and, and, and what causes it. Yeah, of course. So when a CME has arrived here at Earth, and we're just talking about CMEs, there's other phenomena that can cause the aurora as well. There's usually an increase in the charged particles that are flowing through space always from the sun. And that increase, along with the magnetic intensity and changes going on there, they interact with Earth's magnetic field. And that can, when it connects, it sends in these charged particles into the outer layers of our atmosphere, where they collide with our numerous numbers of molecules that exist out there. And because of those interactions, eventually light is released. And that light is what we see as the Northern Lights or the Aurora. 
And I know that there are, we, we, they're sometimes measured by something called a K index uh, or a KP index. And this is something that we often show on our air. Uh, we usually talk about having, needing a seven or higher for us to see auroras here in New England. Do you have any indication I saw on, uh, I think it was the Space Weather website earlier, that we could get as high as eight or nine tonight in that KP index? Any indications already if that may be the case? Yeah, Terry, you're right about the KP index. Uh, that's one of our measurement tools. Uh, when we get to that scale, that index, by the way, is zero through nine, and it's divided into three parts at each number, kind of a low end, a mid, and a high end. And the NOAA space weather scale comes in when we get to KP of five. So we have levels that are important that we already warned about at KP of four, but once you get to KP of five, now it's intense enough to warrant NOAA space weather scale status. And it takes a G1 for people in the far northern tier to see the aurora. A G2, it creeps a little south. And yes, that's correct. About a G3 or KP of 7, New England can most certainly see the northern lights in at least the northern parts of New England, uh, as long as conditions are favorable. And by that, I mean we get that nice strong connection with that magnetic field from the CME. A KP of 8 or a G4, yeah, most certainly much of New England out into Massachusetts could, could see the aurora out under a nice dark sky. What we can determine right now from the CME arrival is it's still in the shock phase. It's still orientated in an unfavorable orientation, but that could easily change over as the day progresses. So it's something to stay tuned to uh, on our web pages, that real-time solar wind. We will certainly stay tuned to that. I know I will. Um, a lot of times these, uh, we get the question, you know, could this be something powerful enough to cause some sort of grid failure, uh, you know, radio out, uh, outages? Any, any, any indication along those lines if there's anything I'd like to be concerned about in, in, in that area? Yeah, of course. Uh, we are concerned about this, CME. We never know when we put out this watch like we did the G4 watch. It's based off the potential. But the potential without knowing what that orientation is going to be when it arrives here and passes over Earth. The storm in May, it arrived south, meaning favorable. It stayed connected for 36 hours as that train of CMEs passed over Earth. That was really quite remarkable that it stayed favorable for that long. Uh, this one here, we have to see it's one main CME, a very speedy CME that we're dealing with right now, passing over Earth. Um, and as I mentioned, it's unfavorable at the moment, but that could easily change as it progresses. Uh, but still, based off that potential, we are concerned about a lot of the technological infrastructure we rely upon. The satellite community has already been aware. We've notified them and are contacting them frequently. We've just talked to some entities that utilize Starlink platform. We talked to the North American Power Grid already yesterday morning to give them a way heads up about the potential impact this storm could have because they do cause problems on the electrical transmission uh, transformers and high voltage transmission lines. And with all the hurricane relief efforts going on right now, we had some concern and we've been communicating with FEMA and even the White House Situation Room about the potential of the storm if it should be favorable and, and intense enough to reach potentially even extreme levels. So they're well aware of the situation along with other entities and sectors out there from aviation to GPS users about this storm. I don't know that we could have been any more advanced notification with this effort than what we've done with this particular event. Yeah, agreed. You guys are on top of this stuff. And I, you know, we, we here in the weather office follow along quite, quite closely. Uh, so what would you say to folks in New England? I know you can't, it's a little early to predict, you know, uh, the Aurora's uh, intensity tonight. And you said, we'll, we'll find out about that in the coming hours. But uh, what would you recommend to folks tonight? You know, best chance to see the aurora like, earlier in the evening, later in the evening. Obviously, you need a clear sky, which thankfully we will have tonight weather-wise, um, and an un unobstructed view. But uh, any timing that you would recommend? Yeah, we're getting darker earlier now, obviously, as we move towards winter from fall here. Uh, so that's a good news thing. We got a, a large window. Usually we say two hours in and around the midnight hour. So 10 o'clock to two o'clock in the morning local times is really the prime time because that's when the Aurora Oval is kind of has its furthest south extent is within that window if everything is favorable. Uh, so be doing that, go out to dark skies as much as possible, especially dark skies that are facing north. We have a young moon in the sky, so that should not be a hindrance at all because it's also low in the sky. And that's what people should be looking for and then monitor our webpage or anything that you're producing out there to talk and understand more about that orientation uh, to be favorable. Because that's the time to run out. I did that on Monday night when things became very favorable. 
and we were reaching G3 levels. I failed to see the aurora because I was looking north through some city lights, but colleagues and other people here in Colorado, we got some really beautiful auroral pictures just from a G3 storm. Yeah, we saw the same here in New England, uh, some really nice stuff, especially along the coastline and up in northern New England. Um, one last question I can see behind you on that um, on that imagery, not only did, are you monitoring the CME, but there's a there's a uh, what looks like a comet in that image. Uh, I know the comet is another thing that folks are going to be interested in, starting uh, as early as tomorrow night and going through the weekend, perhaps being visible on our western horizon. Um, is there any, was there any is there any relation with the CME and the, the comet was passing, I believe, about midway between the Earth and the Sun? Was there any impact from the CME and the comet as it as it passed by? Yeah, Terry, I'm unaware of any impacts to the comet itself. So far, it's holding together very well, which is great news for those of us that love to look for these kinds of events. And you're right, it's now trans. It's moving around the sun. We haven't seen a comet that intense and strong in, in our coronagraph. That's what we, how we look for these CMEs. It makes an artificial eclipse of the sun. And that's how we measure them. Going across the sensor like that, we've seen many comets. Usually they're much smaller and you, they don't survive their, their solar transit around it. Uh, but this one is. And the evening sky in the west, as you mentioned, beginning as early as tonight, but certainly maybe by Sunday or, or Monday night, it should be high enough above the horizon for people to get a glimpse of this comet and maybe get some spectacular pictures of it as well. With And, and that's with the naked eye you, you you think we'll be able to see it? It'll be quite obvious? It's at a naked eye brightness. The problem is you're dealing with a sunset, right? So the sky, sky still has a lot of glow. So don't be mm -hmm. disappointed if you don't see it. And of course, the as the days progress, it's going to get higher in the sky, but also dimmer because it's rapidly going to be moving away from the sun. So you just have to be patient and continue your luck. Have your camera gear ready and your eyes and binoculars ready and see if you can glimpse that thing along the western horizon as it climbs higher in the sky. And what, what a year for astronomical events. I, 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 can you remember a year like this with, you know, the, the total solar eclipse, uh, obviously the auroras that have been going on? I mean, for you guys, this just must be like a Christmas time all year long here. What's great about it is it's, it's brought attention to space weather. You know, broadcasters such as yourself and radio crews, we've gotten all sorts of requests for interviews and information, which is fantastic because space weather is hard and it's very difficult for people to understand it because it's complicated. Talking about magnetic fields and things called coronal mass ejections and solar radiation storms, this is hard stuff to comprehend and understand. So I'm really glad that these things are happening because it draws awareness to space weather. And I'm particularly uh, grateful that entities such as yourselves, Terry, are doing these kinds of interviews and talks with us here because it helps the general public better understand space weather and what it means for us all. Yeah, I, we think meteorology is a tough science. Space weather is a whole nother level. Uh, don't, don't, you know, obviously very complex to, to try to predict something that's coming 93 million miles away from the sun and about to impact the Earth. So... Sean, uh, thank you for that great information today. Uh, obviously, you and I will probably be in touch as the day goes on. I'd love to get information from you and updates from you. I think folks should uh, also check out spaceweather.com. Is that where you would suggest uh, folks to, to keep sort of abreast of the situation here as the day goes on? There's many sources. Of course, I'm going to recommend our webpage, swpc.noaa.gov. That's swpc.noaa.gov, because they can watch the real-time solar wind plot for themselves, just as anybody can. And if you if you do watch that, watch the top plot on there, the white lines and the red lines. The white line tells you the magnetic strength. Our normal background is the number five, and we're up now near near closer to 40 a little bit ago. Uh, because of the CME, and then watch that red line. If that red line is on the bottom of the plot, it's south, it's favorable. If it's up with the white line, it's unfavorable. That's something to keep checking out on our webpage. I will be glued to that all day long. Sean, thanks again for all the great info, and uh, hopefully we have another big, big night tonight as far as auroras are concerned, uh, and we'll talk with you again in the future. Thanks, Sean. All right. Thanks, Terry.